question quiz. Eh, maybe two questions. Are you familiar with the word liturgy? Yeah? All right. Secondly, what does the word liturgy mean? Well, I heard some yeses, but I'm not hearing any answers. <laughs> some kind of fancy church talk. There you go. Liturgy literally means work of the people. Worship is the work of the people. What we come and we offer up to God, a continual sacrifice of praise, or to give ourselves, our very bodies, a living sacrifice before God. Liturgy means work of the people. Most generally, we boil it down to the idea of the form or the structure of our public worship when we are gathered together. Here at Eastview Christian Church, while we don't use the word, hence we don't know what it is, we have a liturgy. It goes like this, song, announcements, two songs, communion, offering with a song, sermon, song, prayer, song, every week. That is our liturgy. Some of you may have come from a church with a, a, a more structured liturgy, although that's quite structured. You may have come from a church background where a, a prayer book was used and there were readings, Old Testament, New Testament, Gospels, a recitation of a creed, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, a recitation of certain prayers, maybe the Lord's Prayer, a homily, because in some of those churches they don't call it a sermon. It, it all has to do, though, with what we do when we come together as a community in worship. And really, this is nothing new. I hope that you have your Bibles. I hope you'll turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and follow along with me from verse 26 through the end of the chapter. You'll notice in verse 26 three little words, at least in the New American Standard. It might be four in your translation. The NASB says, when you assemble. Some other translations say, when you come together. So what Paul's talking about here is exactly what we do when we meet on a Sunday morning or when we meet in life group or Iron Men or a family night. It's the times when the church gathers in whole or in part. Notice what he has to say. What is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or at the most three, each in turn, and one must interpret. But if there's no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others pass judgment. But if a revelation is made to another who's seated, the first one must keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn, and all may be exhorted. And the spirits of prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but a peace, as in all the churches of the saints. The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they're not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Was it from you that the word of God first went forth, or has it come to you only? If anyone thinks he's a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. But if anyone does not recognize this, he's not recognized. Therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid to speak in tongues, but all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. Boy, there's a lot there, isn't there? I'm going to do something drastically different today, so hold on with me, okay? And, and, and if this works, we'll give God the glory. And if it flops, just chuckle at Bill a little bit when the day's over, okay? God gets the glory, I get the blame. Fair enough? 
All right. Let me walk through a few things here. First of all, this idea of when we assemble. I've already mentioned that. When we come together. And I think it is important for us to do just this. If you go back to the very beginning in Acts chapter 2, the church met together daily in one another's homes and in the temple courts, in small groups and in a large corporate gathering. And when they did so, their hearts were full of the teaching of the apostles, of prayer, of fellowship one with another, and of gathering around the Lord's Supper to remember what he has done. These things were so vital and so important. I want to tell you guys, thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for being here this morning. At least it's not 50 below. Amen. You know? But we do live in a day, and time, an age where even within the church, doing this is holding less and less importance in people's lives. I've got other things to do. Hey, I went to church twice last month. That should be good. And it's not a matter of, hey, I'll go to heaven if I go to church and I'll go to hell if I don't. That's not even the point. The point is that the church gathers. And it, it troubles me. So I want to thank you guys. Thanks for being here this morning. Thanks for making the worship of our Creator a priority in your life. Thank you for coming to meet Jesus, the Savior and Redeemer of our souls at His table. Thank you for lifting up your voices in praise and bowing your knees in prayer. This is what we do. And I'm excited for it. So he says, when you assemble... This coming together is important. And then he says, when you assemble, each one of you have something to contribute. Boy, that might catch us totally off guard. Because what we have developed over 2,000 years of church life is what we have going on right here. I'm on the platform. You're sitting in a pew trying to stay awake. Hopefully, I bring to you from the Word of God something that is going to impact your soul and draw you closer to Jesus. We had three people sing. We had Lynn lead us in communion and offering. One of the elders will lead us at prayer at the end. But the rest of us, what do we bring? Where's our participation? You know... My next comment, I've wrestled with whether I'm going to say this or not. I'm going to say it because it, it, it sounds critical, and it, and it is. <laughs> In the 21st century, we've unfortunately turned church, quote, unquote, into sitting in theater seats in a darkened auditorium watching a show on a stage. That isn't worship. It's not. Paul says, when you assemble, each one of you brings a psalm. That's the old word for psalm. Lynn, it's time to stand up and sing Amazing Grace as a solo to bless our hearts. Come on. Come on. Come on. I told you, I'm doing things different today. One verse. One verse. And, and, can the ch <laughs> and can the church, the church's people, give an amen to that? Amen simply means an agreement. You know, amazing, amen. 
You know, and that wasn't meant to embarrass you. I'm going to embarrass a whole lot of people today, just so you know. At least I'm out of the way. You're out of the way, man. <laughs> Someone had to go first. You know, when, when your mom is a music teacher, you got to grow up and be able to sing, right? Unfortunately. He says, when you, when you assemble, each one of you brings a psalm. You, you, and, and, and for that early church, remember, their song book, their prayer book was the psalms of the Old Testament. And, you know, I don't know what they sounded like. We don't have any notations from those, but they would sing in a way that brought blessing to others. He says then four things that all have to do with how we speak. Teaching, which is instruction in, in the apostles' doctrine. Okay? That's what I do. I open up a text. I read a text. I try to explain a text. Revelation. That means I learned something. God has helped open my eyes to something I did not understand before. And I want to share this with you. Tongues. And, you know, I don't know your background. We're going to skip on that one today, lest we create doctrinal chaos. But in that early church, there was an opportunity to speak something that maybe I didn't even understand, but it had to be done in conjunction with someone who did understand so that they could make it clear. See, all four of these have to do with what we talked about last week, knowing the Word of God well enough so that we can speak it into the lives of our brothers and sisters for what? Did anyone catch it as I read? Verse 26, you've got it. Let all things be done for edification. Let all things be done for edification. Then in verse 31, he's going to, learn, he's going to add so that all may learn and that all may be exhorted. And that word exhort from last week means, was anyone here last week? Encourage, thank you. So we want to speak in to build up, to strengthen the church and make each of us strong for the living of our faith and encourage each other so that we keep on going. If you're on my email list, and most of you should be, all of you should be, if you're not, give me your email clearly written out and I'll put you on it. You got on Friday my note from Bill. I asked you to do three things. To come this morning with a Bible in hand, a scripture in mind, which God has been speaking into your life most powerfully lately, and three, a willingness to share it with the congregation. Lynn has given us a psalm. If we go on in this chapter, Paul's going to tell us five things that we need to be mindful of in this gathering for two reasons. One, because God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace. God doesn't call us together so that we can all jibber-jabber at the same time and get nothing out of it. But he wants things to be done secondly in the last verse, decently and in order. That's liturgy. That's the flow. That's the structure. And so we've, we've unfortunately, as I've already hinted at or said, we've limited it to the guy in the, in the pulpit. He says five things. He says, one, tongues must be interpreted or not spoken. It's not that you're out of control when the Spirit is guiding you in this way of a language that you do not know. He says, if there's no one to interpret, then be quiet. The second thing he says is prophecy. And if you remember last week, that means to speak forth the words of God, kind of what a preacher does, what Lynn and others do in the communion meditations. It, 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 it should be shared. He says two or three, two or three prophets are to speak, which is interesting because usually there's just one in a sermon role. That's me. Maybe two if we add the communion meditation. And then he says that the others should judge what's said. That, that, that word's maybe a little bit misleading. What, what Paul wait, writes is that the others should weigh carefully what is said. It reminds me of the Bereans in the book of Acts. Remember them? They listened to Paul. They readily, they eagerly received the message, but they measured it 
against the scripture to see if what Paul said was right. They weighed carefully what was said. He speaks to women, and I, this could be a whole sermon in itself, and you ladies probably sat there as I read verses 34 and 35 and were pulling your hair out. I had a conversation with one of my daughters. I have five daughters. None of them have ever listened to me. Oh, one of them just left. <laughs> oh, well. Verses 34 and 35 are hard. And like I say, it could be a sermon of its own, and I don't want to do that today. If we go back to chapter 11, verse 5, we'll remember that Paul said that the women in the church, when they pray or prophesy, when they speak to God or they speak to God's people on God's behalf, let their head be covered. And that was speaking about what? Authority. Now he comes here and he says, let the women be silent in church. One of the, the guys sitting here this morning, I'll let you, I'm not going to tell you who, you can just kind of play with this, said, Bill, is your slide going to say women shut up? <laughs> and I thought, no way. <laughs> no way. Um, because I don't want to be tarred and feathered. Um, how do you balance chapter 11, verse 5, with chapter 14, verses 34 and 35? I don't know. I have wrestled with this issue literally for decades. Literally for decades. When I was in college, and I think I've told you this before, a young lady who was very broad in her understanding of these texts and that women are just the same as men, which is kind of the problem of the theology and philosophies of our day and age, I once told her, I said, you will change your mind when you feel the fires of hell lapping at your feet. That's a quote. Because that was how strongly I felt that ladies could do nothing in the church but work in the nursery and in the kitchen. Now, hey, my wife gives communion meditation. She prophesies. She speaks forth the word of God to enrich the life of the body of believers. You see, I've changed. And yet, there's still something here. I struggle with this text. Therefore, I don't think that the answer lies in embracing only chapter 11 or only embracing chapter 14. The answer lies in embracing them both. Not how do they contradict each other, but how do they complement each other. William Barclay says that a lot of this had to do with the idea of wives embarrassing their husbands. The church isn't a place for wives to undermine the, what, the authority that we talked about back in chapter 11 of their husbands. Some think that it was cultural. In that world of the Greek Empire, where, or the Roman Empire with Greek philosophical influence, that the Greeks' understanding of the role of women would have, if the ladies in the church had just been very forward in their sharing, that the Greeks would not have listened and even more so that the Jews would not have listened. Some think that's the answer. I don't know. But here's what I know. God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. And God wants everything to be done decently and in order. The God works in and through his people, men and women, both. And the Holy Spirit gifts as he sees fit to gift. And therefore, we need to work that. I know that's probably not satisfactory to you in your hearing. But I'd challenge you to wrestle with it. I'd challenge you to read what Paul has to say to the Corinthian church, to the Ephesian church through Timothy and other places. And we'll keep, keep wrestling with it as we go. Paul will go on and he'll say in verses 36 to 40, basically he says, please don't ignore the things that I'm writing or distort what you've received. He says, what I've written to you is a commandment of the Lord and you can't change it. So if you ignore it or distort it, you're not being faithful to the Lord. 
So when we read texts like women in the church, we really have to struggle with them and wrestle with them so that we know what the Lord requires. You know? One of the things that I do struggle with in this whole conversation is how the church just kind of slides further and further away on things in Scripture. You know? If, if you take sexual morality... Well, we came to a sexual revolution and so many young people were living together without the uh, blessing of marriage that, well, the church that once spoke against fornication ceased to speak on it very much. But, man, we hammered adultery. But then adultery became more acceptable and, well, we we're going to make people uncomfortable if you talk about it, so we quit talking about adultery. But we could talk about homosexuality and we, we hammered on it. And we're kind of in that point, but if you pay attention, the church is beginning to move over here because, well, we just, we're tired of the battle. Where do, you, where do you draw the line? Where do we finally stop moving away from the foundation of Scripture and we take a stand? Whether it be the roles of men and women, whether it be sexual morality, whether it be how one comes to Christ in faith and repentance and baptism, where do, we, where do we say, I will stand on the scriptures or I'm going to flow with the culture? I want to stand on the scriptures, my friends. I have no other authority, but it does take some study. Even the Apostle Peter writes in inspired scripture that many distort the writings of Paul as they do the other scriptures. Paul was hard to understand. <laughs> Even Peter said so. So we don't want to distort or ignore what's been written. Now, with these things said, I want us to take a time for mutual edification. I asked you in my email, bring a Bible in hand, a scripture in heart, and a willingness to share. Without confusion and decently in order, And some of you think, oh, I can just read it from my seat and people will hear me. No, not everyone's as loud as I am. I'm going to ask that you would stand, that you would share your scripture, and share briefly why that scripture, what God, what God is doing in you. Why is that scripture important to you in this season of your life? What is it that God's doing? You get to be a part of the assembled body of Christ where each one has something to share. A psalm, a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. The floor is yours.